grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our meditation is based on the parable of the unmerciful servant. You will see how the Son of God entered this fallen world in order to break you free from a prison of our own making. Again, from the parable, and his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So far the text, let us pray. Lord Jesus, bless thy word that we may trust in thee. Amen. On Mount Sinai, God gave his people ten commandments. And along with that perfect standard of right and wrong, hundreds more statutes and ordinances as a, as a legal system in order to give order and structure to their society. But in all those varied Old Testament laws of Moses, there is never once mention of a prison, no jail, no one locked away as punishment for a crime. Now the laws of Moses certainly did institute a criminal justice system, a harsh one, where the punishment met the crime in excruciating detail. It's from Exodus that we get the phrase, an eye for an eye. But the consequence of a transgression is to be equal in measure to the gravity of the act itself. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. The old school method, so to speak, of teaching your toddler not to bite other people by making sure they know what it feels like to be bitten themselves. Burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. But in all of Moses' writings, the hundreds of laws detailing how each retribution should be carried out there is no mention of prison. In God's wisdom, that would be a waste of their social resources. If any crime was so severe, it required you to be separated from absolutely everybody else, well, there was a far more efficient and cost-effective measure to guarantee that. Life for life. By God's own institution, capital punishment made for certain there would be no repeat offense, and with no need for federal room and board. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. So, in the parable we consider today, where the Lord Jesus speaks of prison, a place where an offender is kept locked away in an endless state of captivity, Jesus is using imagery of a concept completely foreign to the laws of Moses, and thus would have been foreign to each of his Jewish listeners if it weren't for the fact that by Jesus' time, prisons had become a more popular option brought into Israel by foreign invaders like the Greeks and Romans. Meaning, when the unmerciful servant who cannot get his tooth for a tooth out of his fellow servant, he chooses to appeal to a higher law outside God's word for personal vengeance. In other words, 
the laws of Moses not getting him what he wants. He turns to the Roman system of jurisprudence. But this unmerciful servant learns the hard way, by parables close, that the law, regardless of a culture, leads nowhere good. Now, our modern, supposedly enlightened culture considers long-term imprisonment to be the more compassionate alternative to capital punishment, the sword clearly given the king according to God's word. But the Greek and Roman systems of locking people up for debts against neighbor in society was no act of mercy on their part. It was thoroughly self-serving. To their pagan culture, with a fatalistic attitude toward death, no real mature thought of a life after this one, the Roman concept of slave labor, of the debtor prison, was the preferable, more profitable option. If they're going to die anyway, might as well get out of them what you can before they do. In this sense, we still have debtor prisons today. For every time the sinner refuses to let go of the debt of another, fails to show the perfect mercy and forgiveness the king first shows the servant in the parable, we hold one another captive to that which we refuse to let go. Keeping those who have hurt you in the past locked up in a mental jail cell of something awful they've said or done. A sentence, no trial, no jury, no amount of evidence to the contrary could overturn. Yet the sinner is apt to deal with these you'd rather not have around all the same, as as long as they're there, you, you might as well get out of them what you can. Thus in turn, each instance, you drag yourself to help and serve those who hold something over you, not so much out of love, but from the burden of still trying to make up for, earn your freedom in vain from what you've done. At times, these unmerciful ways with one another do profit with a little cash in the pocket. More so, it profits the ego. For as long as you don't have to fully forgive, you also don't have to pay up. Own up to your part of the wrong. Such spiritual prisons are very much real. Otherwise, you wouldn't feel the guilt, remember the hurt you do. But just as prisons are found nowhere in God's law, so too, this is something of our own making, something we do to ourselves, and completely foreign to the word of our Lord, completely incompatible with that Lord's standard of righteousness. Thus, like the child taught not to bite by being bitten himself, the unmerciful servant is turned over to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due, as a picture of how, in the end, no escaping Moses' tit for tat. The sinner, likewise, deserves to learn what our lack of mercy tastes like for eternity. As Jesus warns, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. 
There the parable ends. The soul in prison, mine and yours included, leaving everyone hanging there, waiting with bated breath. Is there really no way out? Ah, the good news is, they're about to find out. In fact, when Jesus uses all this imagery of the debtor's prison, he is oh so cleverly setting his listeners up in anticipation, leaving them desperate for the great prison break about to happen. Remember, the Roman concept of jail was, was self-serving to get as, as much out of the inmate as you could. This meant the prison warden was always more than eager to have cash in the pocket. Sell the prisoner off to anyone willing or foolish enough to pay the debt and take the sad soul into their care instead. A redeemer. The parable ends with a cliffhanger, the soul in torment till the price is paid, which leaves the ear to linger, the mind to wonder if anyone, anyone could show the mercy needed to set the unmerciful free. Just who could forgive me? Jesus. The preacher across whose very lips this parable flows. The Son of God who descended from above and entered the dark dungeon of this fallen world in order to break in, conquer, and set you free from the spiritual prisons of your own making, eternal death. For this parable from Matthew's Gospel, here at the close of chapter 18, only ends with the cliffhanger, holds you in suspense, till you turn the page and watch Jesus in the next chapter begin his final journey on up to Jerusalem, and the chapters soon to follow render his life for you. By suffering at the hands of the keepers of the law, or rather those who had deceived themselves into thinking they could keep it, and suffer beneath the guise of their wounds and stripes, the torments of the true warden of our incarceration in sin, the devil. Remember, jails were a Roman thing. So it's Pilate whom they turn to to get the most out of Jesus before he dies. And here you see how a convenient a thing this prison system was, since at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would, in order for the governor to look good in the people's eyes. Their choice, though, a, a man who truly should have been locked up, Barabbas, and they desire for Jesus, let him be crucified. But in so acquiescing to keep social peace for himself, Pilate becomes the unwitting pawn in God's eternal plan to make peace with you. When having fulfilled every statute from Mount Sinai, the law of God in full, Jesus offered up his righteousness in exchange for your soul, shedding his priceless blood as payment for your debt of sin in order to redeem you to be his own. This is the great prison break from the torment of our unmerciful ways, accomplished when Jesus broke forth from the dirt the third day as your freedom from sin, death, and hell.
as we sing on Easter, because Christ is risen from the grave's dark prison, we now rejoice with gladness, trusting him to end all sadness. For he who died and rose again has now ascended on high to lead, as the, as the Psalms declare, captivity captive. Lead you out of captivity to the devil, that wicked foe ever eager to get whatever he can out of poor souls deluded in unbelief. Lead you out of his torments to be held captive instead by the victory yours in him that the Lord God might dwell among us. For by the divine power of a forgiveness no human heart could muster forth, you now belong to him, liberated to live a new life by faith, a life where this your King and Savior is eager to get as much out of you, dear soul, as he can. As Luther explains your newfound sense of purpose in him, that I should be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from death, lives and reigns to all eternity. As foreign as the Roman system was to the laws of Israel, Oh, how far more foreign this gospel is to our ways with one another. Use it then to your advantage. Appealing to this highest authority of grace for every unmerciful moment you found in yourself that his spirit might in turn rend from off of you the shackles we place on ourselves and one another that no longer operating under the eye-for-eye, tooth-for-tooth system of retribution which leads nowhere good, you might set others free and in every way you deal with them in reflection of the mercy so shown you. Bearing one another's burdens and patience, releasing them from their hefty list of debts and weaknesses, by treating those in your life in ways they too do not deserve. All found encapsulated in one simple prayer, simple enough to begin and end each of your days. Forgive us, Lord, our trespasses, that we might go and forgive those who trespass against us. Remembering that for every moment you feel trapped in suspense, imprisoned yourself by resentment or doubt, all you have to do is turn the page and in repentance and faith watch Jesus break in and set you free. Now the peace that passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.